Okay, static fire testing going well. Everything looks good. Oh, that definitely just broke the test stand. This is, or was, my version 1 test stand. A test stand is an apparatus that measures the thrust produced by a rocket motor. The specifics of test stand construction vary, but they are all built basically the same. You start with a sturdy base, upon which is mounted a strain gauge, a device that measures force. Then we have a rocket motor holder and the motor itself. The rocket motor is placed with the nozzle facing upwards so that when it fires it thrusts downward against the strain gauge. The strain gauge measures the thrust and sends the data to a recording device. The data collected is plotted with time on the x-axis and thrust on the y-axis. The thrust curve will then form some shape on this graph, depending on the motor's geometry. Test stands are an invaluable piece of hardware for developing and debugging rocket motors. Here's one in action. As the rocket motor fires, thrust data is collected over time and plotted on a graph. This thrust curve can be used to validate that a motor is producing the expected amount of thrust and not underperforming. It can also be an invaluable tool in diagnosing motor failures. Unfortunately, this design was not resistant to my largest engine catastrophically failing. In the frame by frame, you can see exactly what happened. That load cell is toast. Now, ideally, I would build motors that don't explode, but the next best thing I can do is build another test stand this time with a new design that is resistant to motor explosions. So let's build a better one. I'm using an S-type load cell for this project. S-type load cells are typically employed for when you need to measure both tension and compression, but in this case I'm using one because they have these nice central threaded mounting holes that are going to make designing and building the test stand a heck of a lot easier than last time. Here's what I'd like to build. The load cell slots into an aluminum base, shown here in green, which itself has four mounting holes so that it can be screwed into a piece of plywood for stability. The motor mount, shown here in blue, bolts to the top of the load cell and holds the motor during test firing. Here is just the motor holder on its own. There's a slot milled in the center and a hole for mounting to the load cell. There's a counter bore for a socket cap screw that screws into the load cell from above, and then a big hole for the motor in the center. Time to dig up some appropriate stock from my round stock bin. I've got a nice chunk of aluminum here that seems like it's going to work nicely. Now, if you don't have a lathe, you can probably just 3D print this part and it'll be just as good, but I want my part to be as durable as possible, so I'm going to make it out of aluminum on the lathe. Every lathe project starts with facing off the end of the part. I've got a shiny new aluminum cutting insert in the lathe, and that's going to make quick work of this. Now that we're finished with that, Let's take the outer diameter of this piece down to size. In this case, it's going to be about 1.5 inches, though being exact is not really necessary for this. Now we're going to pilot drill and then drill the entire length for an 8 millimeter clearance hole. The clearance hole is for a bolt that will come in through the top and screw into the top of the load cell. Now that we have that clearance hole, we need to blind drill to a depth of 2 inches. Since I have a small lathe, I'm stepping up in 1 8 increments all the way up to my maximum drill size of 1 inch. I then use my boring bar to take the hole the remainder of the way up to a slip fit for a 1.25 inch cardboard tube. About 1.26, 1.27 inches. Then I use the boring bar to face the inside, removing any drill cones left behind and leaving a flat spot for the motor to sit. I forgot to get it on video, but I plunged an end mill in order to create the relief for the socket cap screw head. Then I took the part to the bandsaw and cut it off. After facing the part off in the lathe, I took it over to the mill and used a two flute end mill to cut a slot in the center the same width as the load cell. Time to check the fit, and everything looks excellent. Clamping bolt goes in really easily, and there we have it. Not too bad for about an hour of work. The next part of this project is the base upon which the load cell will sit. It has four mounting holes and then one hole in the center to screw into the load cell from below. The central slot will prevent any lateral forces from applying a twisting motion to the load cell. I'm going to use this particularly thick piece of aluminum, and we're just going to need to mill a slot and drill some mounting holes in it. 
Okay, okay, I know I said this would be quick, but I just gotta clean this up. The slot on the base is the exact same width as for the other part. All it takes is a few passes with a two flute end mill to get to the correct depth. Then I bring the width of the slot to dimension using conventional milling and then climb mill to produce a nice finish. Now we just have to drill and countersink four mounting holes and then one center hole for the load cell. And that's looking pretty great. I mounted it to this scrap of plywood and everything seems pretty solid. Time to work on the electronics. I'm using a spare Arduino Uno for the brains, an SD card shield, and an HX11 load cell amplifier. As you can see, the schematic for this project is pretty straightforward. We're basically just wiring a couple of data lines together and a GPIO for the LED. There is one minor headache though with the HX711 that we're going to have to fix. Opening up the data sheet for the part, we can see that pin 15 controls the sample rate. Down here they elaborate and show that if you connect it to logic low, it samples at 10 hertz, and if you connect it to logic high, it samples at 80 hertz. Here's a close-up of the breakout board. Can you spot the problem? Nope. Well, pin 15 is connected to ground, but it's connected through a via underneath the chip. In order to get our full 80 hertz data rate output and not a paltry 10 hertz, we're going to need to figure out a way to break this trace. If the trace were simply exposed, then we could cut it. Unfortunately, we're going to have to do something a bit drastic here. I've bent a sewing needle into a tiny little hook shape, and I'm going to be using this as the world's smallest crowbar. I'm demoing this on a different version of the board, which ironically has a trace that could have been cut. So I guess depending on what board you get, you might get lucky. I heat the pad with my soldering iron, and as soon as the solder becomes molten, I'm using my makeshift tiny crowbar to very carefully pry the pin upward, disconnecting it from the existing trace. You have to be very slow and delicate doing this, otherwise metal fatigue might snap the pin. Once you're sure that you've broken the existing electrical connection to the trace, you can solder a 10k pull-up resistor between the pin and VCC. Now the chip will sample at the full 80 hertz. While you were busy with that, I went ahead and soldered the rest of the connections underneath the SD card shield board. Now all that's left to do is connect the wires from the load cells to their appropriate terminals. The code for the Arduino is dead simple. On startup, read the value of the load cell and set that as your zero point. Then just read the load cell value each time the data is ready and stored in the SD card. That's all it takes. I'll provide a link to my code if you'd prefer not to write it yourself. I also plan to add some additional features later. An LCD screen would probably be nice and would save me the trouble of having to download the data off the SD card each time. Alright, let's see if it's working. Everything's looking good so far. Now we just need to calibrate it. Every load cell is slightly different, so to account for that we're going to calibrate against a known force. In this case, I grabbed a piece of steel I had lying around and measured it with my gram scale. Looks like 1937 grams, which when converted to newtons is, um, just off the top of my head, multiplied by, um, 19 newtons. I knew that. So all we need to do is take our 19 newton calibration force, apply it to the load cell, and adjust the calibration factor until we read 19 newtons exactly. Eh, close enough. I designed and 3D printed a simple enclosure to protect the electronics. The Arduino Uno is slotted into the bottom and screwed in with socket cap screws. Then we install the SD shield with the load cell amplifier board. Quick check to make sure everything lined up and I can slide the SD card in and out nicely. I forgot that I needed some kind of hole for the wires to come out the back, so I'm just going to make that real quick with a hacksaw. Then in order to protect the wires from getting ripped out of their screw terminals, I'm just going to add a little bit of hot glue and glue it to the back of the enclosure. A proper strain relief would have been nice, but this should do just fine. I decided to make the electronics box removable so that it can be located further from the motor during testing to prevent damage in the event that the motor explodes. In order to accomplish this, I'm gluing Velcro to the bottom of the electronics box and then also to the top of the build platform. Now we can just grab the box and move it elsewhere. I machined a couple of inserts so that this test stand can be used with different sized rocket motors. Now, there's nothing to say that we can't stop right here, but there is one tiny improvement we can make to make this thing even better. I'm pulling out the gauge block set because I want to use them to find the exact amount of compression the load cell undergoes at its maximum rated force of 50 kilograms. I used trial and error to figure out the exact height I needed to allow the load cell to bend just enough to reach 50 kilograms, but no further, 
This way, if the motor explodes and produces an excessive amount of downward force, it won't break the load cell like last time. Yeah, those'll buff out. Now we just need to machine a couple of aluminum blocks that will match this height exactly. Aluminum or plastic would be just fine for this task. Just make sure that you nail that dimension exactly, and everything will be fine. Our protective spacers are done, and I went ahead and affixed mine permanently with super glue. Quick side note here. I'm constantly amazed at how these strain gauges can deflect so little and yet be so accurate. The gap remaining between those pieces is probably only a few thousandths of an inch, and yet that tiny amount of flex is what is measured and is the difference between 0 and 50 kilograms of force. Wild. Well, nothing left but to test it out. I'll be testing with my largest motor first, the 1.25 inch diameter F motor, which maxes out at about 30 pounds of thrust. Don't forget the SD card, otherwise you won't have any data. A quick reminder, please do not build and test rocket motors unless you're capable of doing it safely. These motors are fairly small, but I still make sure to test the motors in a non-flammable area and carry a fire extinguisher with me just in case. Don't forget to place yourself far enough away or behind obstacles so that in the case of a motor explosion you aren't in the line of fire. Alright, finally. Testing in 3, 2, 1. Okay, well, to the naked eye, that looked fine. Let's check the data to see if there's anything unusual with this test. If I replay the test in slow motion, we can actually see and hear some combustion instability. This combustion instability is clearly visible in the thrust curve as these little perturbations in an otherwise smooth graph. Now, this amount of combustion instability isn't a huge problem, but it generally accompanies poor motor performance, and if you look at the max thrust, you can see that it's only at about 23 pounds instead of around 30 like we're expecting. The usual fix for this problem is to reformulate the fuel. Without the data from the test stand, we might not have had any idea there was actually a problem to fix here. Here's a test of a different motor, again played back in slow motion. Everything's looking pretty reasonable on this test, until that happens. The spike in thrust you see here is usually caused by a structural problem with the fuel grain. Small cracks in the propellant can cause the flame to propagate through them, burning the fuel much faster than expected. This causes the motor to rapidly consume its remaining fuel and leads to this spike at the end of the burn. You can see that our max thrust here was 47 pounds on a motor that should have produced about 30 pounds of thrust. This means that the internal pressure in the motor was actually way higher than it should have been, and honestly, it's a surprise to me that the tube didn't burst. Without the data from this test stand, we might not have had an idea that there was a huge problem or that the motor was unsafe to use. We might have decided that this motor design was good, launched a rocket with it, and destroyed it. Thanks to the data from the test stand, that won't happen. Now, remember how in the beginning of this video I told you that my motivation for building the test stand was to make it resistant to motor explosions? Well, one of my new motors did in fact rupture during testing. Watch this. Here's the same video, but further away and with the thrust curve data. A pretty spectacular failure. But did the test stand survive? Well, the plywood base certainly has some battle scars, but thankfully, the electronics and strain gauge are still functioning perfectly. I think we can call that a win. Well, that's about it for now. If you want to build this project yourself, I'll include links to the parts list as well as the schematics and code in the description of this video. Also, feel free to subscribe or follow me on my blog, projectsinflight.com. I've also got a Patreon if you want to be a part of making more projects like this happen. Thanks for stopping by!